announcements for you, and then we'll have Jason and Allison and the family come up here and uh, remind us of the reason for this season called Advent. All right? Here are a few of your announcements. We want you to remind you that every week we make sure your children are completely safe. We abide by all CDC rules in our nursery and our children's church so that your children are completely safe. Also, uh, when you leave today, and I'll hopefully remind you again, uh, Deb Sarge has prepared chili for everyone. So when you leave, you go through those doors, you can pick up the chili to take home. It's already hot, it's already ready. You don't have to go out to eat, all right? So take some with you. Remind you of our crew ministry. Crew stands for Christians Ready and Equipped and Willing. And we go out um, once a month and we try to find someone locally we can serve and help with. Uh, this uh, is a man we helped build a ramp with recently. And this coming Saturday, we're going to be working on a ramp for an elderly couple. So if you can help Keith, Sergeant, and the crew team, there's his number. If you'd like to do some local missions and put a little muscle into it, make a difference in people's lives, do that. Our Revelation Bible study resumes back this Wednesday night. Okay, what else is next? All right, the last Wednesday night Bible study for 2020. Can you believe we're almost to the end of this year? We'll be December 16th, and we'll pick back up January 6th. Our Lottie Moon International Mission offering is $4,000. This is the Sunday for Hope. And as you see in the Advent season, next Sunday will be peace, then joy, then love. Then on Christmas Eve, it will be the Christ child. There are three ways to give, in person, by mail, and online. And for all of you listening online right now, I want to say thank you for being here and being a part of us. And I want to ask Jason and Allison and their kids to come up and walk us through this season of hope for Advent. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right, nothing seems like it used to be, nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that the nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O oh Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in this mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. Thank y'all. Thank you so much. How was everybody's Thanksgiving? Did you have a good one? Good. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. I uh, wanted you to remember Julie Brewer in our church. <laughs> Julie has a, um, several issues going on with her. One, she has a compromised immune system, and so she has made sure she has done everything. She never leaves the house except in rare occasions, uh, and she has tested positive for COVID, and she has not a clue as to how she got it. Uh, for someone who is so cautious. So remember Julie in your prayers this week, and you can think of it, give her a word of encouragement. Bill has moved out of the house during the quarantine period to stay with others so that she can have a full recovery. All right. Turn around and wave at your neighbors. Just say good morning or something to them, all right? Thank you. I needed that. It's hot up here. You keep waving. That feels good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all right? I'm glad you're here today. We're in this ongoing series called uh, God is Good All the Time. And we're looking at that most time we give God credit for being good when things are good in our life. But the scriptures affirm that even when things are not so good, when they're bleak, when they're dark, as a few weeks ago when we were walking through that valley of the shadow of death, meaning uh, the Hebrew says a valley of deep darkness, that as we walk through that deep period of darkness in our life, God is with us. He will help us get through that valley. And so uh, that's what this series is about. And Psalm 23 is the book we're using and the chapter we're using to help us understand that. So I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever experienced that life can really wear you down so that you've got nothing left to give? You ever felt that way? 
uh, I was online just researching and I read this letter that a, a man wrote to his church. They had a, a prayer link on their website. And here's what he writes. I feel like I'm a, in a war zone. There's just one battle after another. I argue with my wife. I clash with my kids over everything. I fight to keep my job. I struggle with our growing debt, and I'm losing the battle with my weight. And then there's the conflicts inside of me. I fight my own fears, and I have battles with my anxieties and with my own temper. And I'm always fighting off some form of depression. Sometimes I'm just fighting to keep my head above water, and I'm just so tired. Is there not any good word from God to help me? And so when I read that, I thought, how does the how does Psalm 23 and how does God being good all the time help a man who feels this desperate, this down, walking through this kind of darkness? I mean, when you're in the battle for your life, the battle for your marriage or the battle for your finances, the battle for your job, and it looks bleak, I mean, how does God's goodness help you get through that? Well, that's what Psalm 23 is about. Six short verses, 12 different pictures 12 different illustrations that show us what God's goodness is like in each of those cases. And what we've been doing every week is taking the first line of each of those verses, and then the second part of that verse, and the third part each week, just breaking it down phrase by phrase, applying this to our life as to how not only is God good, but how does that goodness help us when things are bleak and dark in our life? Because you're going to go through periods like this. As our, we were reminded just a few moments ago in this Advent about hope. Whoever thought this would be normal? I mean, now they have designer masks. Have you noticed that? You can get your own designer mask. It's a fashion statement now. And even if the vaccine comes out and we can all get inoculated and we're all not going to have to live with this anymore. As I look back over this year and last year, I was just talking the other day with someone. I said, I, I feel for the kids in school. They're not enjoying. They can't even go to class. They can't have the experiences that I've had growing up and even their peers had growing up. Everything has changed for it. It is a brand new world and things are not the way they are supposed to be. So how... Can God's goodness help us get through periods like this? And that's Psalm 23. It addresses those issues. And today we come to the first phrase in verse 5, where David writes this. You prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. And when I read that, I thought, what in the world? Something written over 3,000 years ago. How does that help me today? All right, you prepare a banquet in presence of my enemies how does that help me? So as I thought about it, I came up with four questions. They're each of your subheadings in your outline, if you pulled it out. We're going to look at four questions this morning based on that phrase of verse 5. And that is, what kind of banquet is it? Who are my enemies? What does the banquet symbolize? And what's on the menu at the banquet? If you go to a banquet, you want to know what's on the menu. If you go out to eat, you want to know what's on the menu. So let's jump right in it. Here's the first thing. What kind of banquet is it? This is the kind of banquet or table where God is the host. God's the host of this banquet. David begins the phrase with you, a reference to God. You prepare. You prepare a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. So this banquet is all God's idea. He's thought it all up for all of us. I mean, think about this. Let's say... While you're sitting here right now, all of you get a message, a text message. Boom. And you pull out your cell phone, and you don't recognize the number. You open it up, and it says, surprise, this is from God. I have a banquet for you, and I have it all laid out, all your favorite foods for every season, every day. It's all laid out. There's a table outside in the parking lot for you, and you're invited to sit down with me and eat it. How many of you would want to do that? I would. I mean, I'm there. But I think I'd be a little nervous. I'd be all right, do I look okay? Is my hair all right? Do I need to go take another shower? You know, whatever, you know? I mean, if you got that invitation, you would love it, but it'd make you a little nervous. Because this is just not anybody's inviting us to the table. This is God himself inviting us. So what I want you to know, this is the kind of banquet or table where God is the host. Here's the second thing about this banquet. This is the kind of banquet or table that is well 
planned. It's well planned. David writes, you prepare a banquet. This is not off the cuff. It's not some spontaneous thing. It's not something God just instantly thought up. It's not something like you say, hey, after church, you, hey, how about we just go down to the beach and eat there? It's nothing like that. It's well prepared. It's not a spur of the moment. In fact, in your notes, I added this little element for you. The Hebrew word translated as prepare is the Hebrew word tarok. And it means to range in order, to set in order. It's the Hebrew word used to put your weapons in order that you will need them in battle. It's also used the, a word that refers to setting one's table in the right way. Or it's for a lawyer, choosing his words carefully. And you know, when you have someone over at your house, like we occasionally do, sometimes we pull out the nice stuff, the nice china. You know what I'm talking about? And inevitably, I still don't get it right. You know, this, I can't remember. It's two spoons, two forks. Where's the knife go? Where's the dessert? But Audrey's right there guiding me through. Honey, this goes here, and this goes here, and that goes there. Because it's got to be prepared well, and it's got to be prepared cor correctly. God didn't just come up with this on his own. He has well thought this out. David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, the Hebrew that is translated there is table is the Hebrew word shukhan. This word refers always to the king's table. It refers to being invited to a banquet with the king where everything is fattening. Everything is great. Everything you could imagine is on this table, okay? He says, you prepare a table. You prepare a banquet for me. Now, this is not some TV dinner. This is not some microwave meal. This is not some little table you set up like we occasionally do if we want to sit and watch something on TV. You know, those little TV tables, you know what I'm talking about? All right, just nod your head that you do. You do it. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, this is not that kind of table. This is the kind of table David is talking about here. It's a table, bring it up, that's that long. You can see a hundred people at it. It's the table in a king's castle. That's the word he uses. He would know he was a king. He would have a banquet room in his palace. It's that long table where you can get everybody around it, where it can hold 50, 75, 100 people, okay? This word is also used occasionally in the Old Testament to refer to the table in the temple where the showbread was set for people to see. But it's, it's an interesting table. It's not this little table you have in your house. It's that long table. But there's another possibility this word means, and a shepherd would use this, okay? In all the countries of the world where shepherds live, and even out in the Midwest where we have shepherds, uh, this, there's a, you'll look out across the terrain and you see this plateau rising up out of the ground, and it's flat on top, okay? They're called mesas. It's a Spanish word for tables. Oddly enough, even in Africa, they use the same word, mesa, for tables. And for thousands of years, people living there would refer to these high plateaus as tables or tablelands which sheep love to go to and graze because they're full of grass. Now, the nice thing about them being so high is that you know where the predators are. There's no bushes for them to hide in. There's no trees for them to hide in. So a shepherd would often take his sheep up to these high, flat plateaus that they called tables or table hands for the sheep to graze. And it was his job to be on alert in case any predator tried to climb up there and get to his sheep. This way, there's no surprise attack. There's no stealth attack. In fact, shepherds would go out and they would scout the areas before they took their sheep up there. They would go and look, where are the predators? Where are they going to hide? What's the means by which they try to come up to the top of this flat plateau? And when they did this, this is what shepherds called it. They called it preparing the table. And maybe this is what David has in mind, that it's not a literal banquet with food on it, but God is working in the areas of your life to keep you protected from the predators in your life that may try to come after you because you're going to have them. We all have them. So God has prepared a table. It could be a table with food on it. It could be a table in a sense symbolically of protecting you from the predators in your life. Here's a third thing about this table. What kind of banquet is it? It's the kind of banquet or table in which you are the guest of honor. You're the guest of honor. David writes this. You prepare a table for me. It's for me. 
This is not for anybody else. You're invited to sit down one-on-one with the king and be his guest. Now, here's the fourth thing about this banquet, the kind of banquet. It's the kind of banquet that's done in public. It's not done in secret. It's done in public. It's not done in secret. David says this, you prepare for me a table in the presence of. You prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies. It's the table that everybody gets to see you sitting at, just you and the king. Did you hear about recently on November 8th, you know, the governor of New York has put a lot of tight restrictions on religious groups coming together. And in my judgment, he's violating their constitutional rights, but that's for y'all to decide whether you agree with it or not. But anyway, some of those rules apply to synagogues. One of the rabbis in Brooklyn, his grandson was getting married. They decided not to have any public announcement, but invite people by mouth, word only. Bring up the picture. This is the kind of banquet that will be on the, bring it up, battlefield. So here he is. He's on the battlefield, okay? And here is this huge, huge, huge battle going on. And all of a sudden, you're invited to it. So what did the, this rabbi do? Guess what he did? He invited over 700 Hasidic Jews. They stood shoulder to shoulder in this synagogue, no mask on. And they said they believed that their constitutional rights to express their faith was being violated by the governor of New York as well as by the media who would advertise this so no one knew. And they took a great picture of it for the whole world to see, hey, this is a slap in your face. We're exercising our constitutional rights. We don't care what you say. We're still going to come together as a people of faith. And at times, we find ourselves being pressured by our enemies. We feel like we're on a battlefield. David says, listen, you prepare a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. We all have them. We all have people looking at us, trying to trip us up, to make us fail, to make us fall. And God says, listen, I'm preparing a banquet for you. I'm throwing this banquet, and you're just going to sit down with me, and we're going to have a conversation. I'm proud of you. I love you. And I want you to eat. I've chosen the best foods, your favorite foods to eat. And I imagine if we run around this room right now, and I say, what's your favorite food? It would vary. It would vary. Some of you love steak. Some of you love ham. Some of you love barbecue chicken and wings. Some of you love breakfast. I mean, some of you love pizza. I mean, uh, if we just said, what's your favorite? Oh, just for fun, just shout it out. What is your favorite food? Just shout it out. All right, thank you. I got it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See? Now, that's on the table for you and everything else you want. God says, I'm preparing a table, a banquet for you, for your enemies to see while you sit down with me. So that brings me to the, another question I had. Who are my enemies? My enemies include the world around me. Jesus warned us about this. He says, the world is your enemy. He said, listen, in the world you will have tribulations and trials and distress and frustrations. Be of good cheer. Take courage and be confident. Okay? Be certain. Be certain of what? Look what he says. Be certain. Be undaunted, for I have overcome the world, and I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Jesus says, the world's your enemy, but you don't need to fear it. I've conquered it. Look what John writes in 1 John. He says this. Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you, for when you love these things, you show that you do not really love God. For all these worldly things, these evil desires like the craze for sex, the ambition to have everything that appeals to you, to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance, these are not from God. They are far from this evil world itself. And this world is is fading away. And these evil, forbidden things will go with it. But whoever keeps doing the will of God will live forever. So the Bible makes it clear the world is our enemy. Here's another enemy you have. My enemies include Satan, that old devil, who's against me. Satan, that devil, is your enemy. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
In fact, Jesus gives us his job description in John 10, 10. He says this, the devil, just like a thief, has only one goal in mind. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. In fact, Jesus, speaking for a group of unbelievers who were ridiculing him after seeing even so many miracles he did, he said this to them, for you are like the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth, and because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you have this unseen but very real enemy in your life. It's called the devil. It's called the demons. They're out to trip you up. This is why we're warned in Ephesians 6. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You have a very real but un invisible enemy, the devil and his demons. And to take that lightly only makes you more vulnerable. He is coming to get you. Now, the devil knows he can't get God directly. He knows that. So what does he do? He does the next best thing. He gets God's children. Let me ask you this. How many of your parents? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. If someone harmed your child, would you say praise the Lord? Or were you going to say you're going to meet the Lord? The best way to get at a parent is not the parent directly, but how? At their children. You attack someone's child, hey, it's going to be blood. And Satan knows he cannot do anything to hurt God directly. So what does he do? He comes after his children. He leads us. He tempts us. He makes us vulnerable to sin. He causes us to trip up and to fall up. And to act like he's not real or his demons only makes you more vulnerable. You have a third enemy. Who are my enemies? My enemies include my old sinful nature. One of the marks of maturity I mean, one of the marks of maturity is to realize that you are your worst own enemy. You bring more problems to your life than anybody else. You are your worst own enemy. And the Apostle Paul understood this, and, and he opens up this truth about himself in Romans 7. He says this, the trouble is with me. He doesn't say the trouble is with the other disciples or the trouble is with the church. He says, the trouble is with me, for I'm all too human. A slave to sin. I don't really understand myself or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against the, more, uh, the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner to the law of sin. This unwelcome intruder in my humanity is my old sinful nature. You are your worst own enemy. I'm my worst own enemy. Now, let's go to the third question. What does this banquet symbolize? Well, here's what Scripture tells us it symbolizes. It symbolizes that God desires and delights in having fellowship with you. He just wants to have a meal with you. He wants to sit down and have fellowship with you. He wants you to know that he not only created you, he gave you a purpose. He, he has allowed his son to die on the cross for you. He offers you salvation he delights and he desires in having fellowship with you because he loves you. And so this banquet is God's way symbolically of expressing it. Even, even in our culture, when we want to do something with someone, when we want to have fellowship with someone, we'll often say, hey, you want to go get a bite to eat? You only invite people to eat with you that you like. You usually don't invite the people you don't like to sit down and have dinner with you. And God says, listen, I want to have fellowship with you. I delight in you. I desire, I want you to know how much I love you. I want to encourage you. I know you're in the thick of the battle. I know things are not going the way you planned. I know things are not turning out the way you wanted. I know you're fighting at work. You're fighting at home. You're fighting in your marriage. You're fighting with the kids. You're fighting it at school. You're fighting it in your job. And all of a sudden, everything was going great, and boom, darkness hits. You find yourself in that valley of the shadow of death, walking through the deep, dark period of your life, and God says, I want to give you a banquet to encourage you. David writes this in Psalm 5, 11. He says this, you welcome us with open arms, meaning God, when we run for cover to you. David says, when we run to God, he opens up his arms to us. 
And what does he say next? I love this last part. Let the party last all night. Stand guard over our celebration. David says that when you and I run to God, God throws a party. He throws a party. He wants you to know, he wants me to know that in spite of our humanity, in spite of our failures, in spite of our sins, in spite of our shortcomings, he loves us unconditionally. I tell you this all the time. There is nothing you can do to make God love you any less. And you can't make do anything to make God love you anymore. He loves you unconditionally. His love is not determined by whether you are good or bad or godly or ungodly, holy or unholy, righteous or unrighteous. It's all determined because he is a good God all the time and he loves you all the time. And he wants to give you a banquet because you're going to blow it. You're going to fail. You're going to mess up. It might happen just as soon as you pull out on College Road. If you get out on that road, it's a test of your faith. Because there are crazy drivers out there on that road. I had the other day, I had this person, I guess they were on their phone texting. They kept coming over my lane, you know, it's two lane. Coming over and I'd slow down, coming over, and then come all the way over and then they go back. They kept just doing this. And they were only doing like 30 miles an hour. Now, I'm a type A person. And I'm sitting there like, Either lead, follow, or get out of my way. And meanwhile, I hear God saying, Kelly, this is the time for me to grow the fruit of patience in your life. You see, God brings little reminders that we are our worst own enemy. And he helps us by throwing a banquet for us so that we can celebrate his goodness in our life. God says, I know you're in the thick of the battle I know you're waging all kinds of different battles in your life. Let me give you a party. So I want you to use your imagination. Imagine you could go back into the time of King Charlemagne. Go back into the time of knights and vassals and where you had castles and turrets on top of those castles. And all of a sudden there's this huge banquet hall. has that table that you can seat 100 people at. And you're out in the midst of a war. You're in Army A. You're the good guys. But you're fighting Army B, the bad guys. Okay? And it's hard. It's hot. It's bloody. And you're, you're on the front line, and you're giving it all you got. I mean, you're fighting. You're fighting. You're fighting. You're getting hungry. You're getting tired. You, you want to break. But the war is there. The enemy keeps coming, and you can't stop because if you do, you're dead. And all of a sudden, there's a tap on your shoulder, and it's a commanding officer that says, come with me. He said, what? Come with me. And he leads you back through the line. He says, uh, about 100 yards over there, you see there? The king has erected a tent. You're to go in there, and you're going to have a meal with the king. And you're sitting there going, I I'm bloodied. <laughs> I'm messy. My deodorant's worn off. I stink. You've got to be kidding me. I, I, I need to clean up first. No, 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 no. You're going just the way you are. Because the king loves you just the way you are. And, and you slowly walk over there and you pull back the curtain slightly. And there he is. There's the king sitting at the end of that table, that long table. And as you scan it, there's every kind of food you love to eat. It's all spread out for you. Every kind of meat you love, potatoes, desserts, it's all there. And you kind of... You're sitting there, you feel unworthy because this is the table he sits down with his leaders, his knights, his advisors, not, not an unknown soldier like you. And, I, and that's why you're sitting there. You walk in and you, you realize he says, have a seat. And you, you, you sit down nervously next to him and he makes a nod and all of a sudden all the curtains on all the sides go up. And everybody on both sides gets to see you having a king having a meal with the king, especially your enemies. And he says, I made all this for you. I had it all prepared for you. We took the big table and the banquet hall, the castle. We just brought it out here because I want to have a meal with you. I want you to know I love you. I want you to know how much I care for you. I want you to know how much I, I'm so proud of you. You're in the thick of this battle. You're fighting for your life. And, and you're, I don't want you to get discouraged. I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to quit. So I've done all this just for you. This says, I love you. In fact, look out there. I, look at that banner going up on that pole. I've had a banner that says, I love. And you put your name there. I love. I love. 
David says, you prepare a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. You're the guest of honor. You're having a meal with this king. It's in your honor because he loves you. I love what Solomon writes in the Song of Solomon. He says this, the king brought me to his banquet table to dine, and he put a banner over me of his love for me. On that banner is your name. You may never have thought that God is proud of you, but he is. You at times may think he doesn't love you because you blow it. He still loves you. You may think he's disappointed in you. Listen to me. I tell you this all the time. You can never disappoint God. Why? Disappointment means I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know it was going to happen. God knows everything. He knows all the past, the present. He knows everything in the future. He already knows what you're going to do tomorrow, five years from now, ten years from now. So when you blow it tomorrow, he doesn't say, Gabriel, boy, I didn't see that coming. He already knew it was coming. So you can't disappoint him. You cannot do that. He is proud of you, especially if you've given your life to Jesus Christ. And so here are the enemies fighting. They're fighting the other side, your, your army. And all of a sudden, everything gets deadly quiet. And you look out through these open drapes that were hanging down, and the war stopped. And everybody's just standing there looking at you at the table. You ever been in a restaurant and had somebody stare at you at the table? Or you stared at them? I've done that going, I know I know them from somewhere. I know I know them from somewhere. How do I know them from somewhere? And for someone like me who's had a stroke, I have to look at Audrey and go, do we know them? Do we know them? Because she'll take pictures, and she'll say, we, we, honey, we ate with them two years ago. No, we didn't. Yes, we, no, we didn't. Yes, we didn't. No, we didn't. So she goes, pull the picture. There you are. I'm going, duh, I don't remember. Okay? But something in my brain goes, hey, we had a meal with them. Everybody stops. Everybody looks at you. God prepares a banquet, a table, just for you in the presence of your enemies. Now listen to me. Why does he do that? To bless you. There's one thing I've learned in life. When God chooses to bless you, not even your enemies can stop it. He will bless you and he will bless you. And what that will do at times will make them jealous and make them envious, but also will create within them a desire when they look at you. Why is God blessing them? It also has the reverse effect. David says, you prepare a banquet for me in front of my enemies or in the presence of my enemies. Look at Job 36, 16. It says this, God is gently calling you from the jaws of distress. Remember that? You remember that? All right, you can stop it. God, <laughs> this is how my brain works. I read that verse calling you from the jaws of distress, and all I could think of was jaws. This big shark coming after me. Okay? It's the same picture. God is gently calling you from the jaws of distress, from the jaws of mess, from the jaws of stress, from the jaws of anxiety and anxiousness and weariness. Whatever is chewing on you, whatever is gnawing on you, God is calling you from it. He says, God is gently calling you from the jaws of distress to an open place of freedom where he has set your table full of the best food. He says, come on over here. You're stressed out. You're, you're in the jaws of this. I, I want to rescue you. I want to save you. I want to get you out of this. Now, like I said, all of us recognize that theme from jaws. And to this day, when I go out in the ocean, I'm, I'm looking. And I was a pilot for years, for years. I'm telling you, when I would fly over Riceville Beach and look down, I'm going, whew, there's a lot of sharks in the water. See, you can't see them, but there are a lot of them out there. And they just swim around us. They just ignore us sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, okay? But there's a lot of them out there. God wants to rescue you from the jaws of distress. So I have a question for you. 
What's chewing on you right now? What's eating you up right now? What is it that's got you worried or anxious or fearful? And it's just gnawing and it's gnawing and it's gnawing and it's gnawing on you. You're stressed out about it. It could be your job. It could be someone you know that has COVID, a family member. It could be your marriage. It could be children who've wandered away from Christ. It could be something financial or relational. What's gnawing on you? God's calling you from that. He's saying, let me rescue you from the jaws of that. And like I said, the world wants to demean you. They want to criticize you. It wants to put you down. It wants to get you in its jaws to defeat you. And God says, listen, look up here. Look at me. Audrey is a school teacher. When she talks to her kids, she'll say, look here, right here. Look at these eyes. God says, look at my eyes. I prepared a banquet for you. I want to encourage you while you're, and not only encourage you, I want to free you from those jaws of distress in your life. I want to have fellowship with you. I've prepared the best food for you. It's all laid out for you. I'm going to rescue you from this if you will trust me. Now, what else does this banquet symbolize? Number two, it symbolizes that God blesses me to show the world his goodness. You are a trophy of God's grace and his goodness. I don't deserve God's blessings. You don't deserve them. We don't deserve his grace, but he gives it to us anyway. You are what I call exhibit A of God's grace. You're God's goodness on display. This is why David writes what he does in Psalm 31. He says this, your goodness is so great. You have stored up great blessings for those who honor you. You have done so much for those who come to you for protection. Meaning, when you're in the midst of this battle, in the midst of this battle, you come to him for protection. He says, blessing them before the watching world. God says, I'm preparing a banquet for you in the presence of your enemies. I want to bless your life. I want everyone to see. I'm proud of you. You're exhibit A, my grace. Yes, those that are jaws of distress, but I'm going to free you from that. So I want you to do is circle the word stored up because it implies something that God has already planned. This is not, again, off the cuff. He's just not making this up as he's going along. He has prepared this ahead of time. He has stored up indicates this advanced planning. It means that God knows ahead of time what he is going to do. He doesn't just think it up. It's already well planned. God says, I've already done all the arrangements. I've pre-planned this banquet for you to honor you, to encourage you, because you're in the midst of these jaws of distress. And it's gnawing on you. It's chewing on you. And you can't get it off your mind. You can't go to bed and sleep peacefully. You can't walk in your house and be peaceful. You can't go to work. It's always on your mind, chewing on you, gnawing on you, gnawing. Come to the table. Come to the table. Sit down with me. Let me encourage you. And right now, some of you know what I'm talking about. There's some things in your life you're white-knuckling about. It could be a financial battle, a health battle, a moral battle, a relational battle. But you feel yourself in that vice grip of those jaws of distress. David says, God says, I have prepared a banquet for me in front of my enemies. He has stored up the blessings for you. It means that That battle that you're fighting right now, which is very intense, before it even started, before you even got into the battle, God had already prepared the victory celebration. The celebration party for the problem you're in right now because he already knows the outcome. See, what I love about God, he already knows the outcome. David writes, you've stored up this banquet for me to celebrate my victory even when I can't see it. To remind me that I'm going to come through this. You're going to help me walk through this valley of darkness. You're going to help me get free from this vice grip of these jaws of distress. David writes in Psalm 35, 27 this. How great is the Lord. He is pleased with the success of his servant. I love that. God wants you successful. And the way he helps you be that is you've got to dine with him. You've got to sit down with him. God loves to honor you. He's given you all kinds of verses in this Bible to encourage you. He's prepared a banquet for you. All you got to do is come down and sit with him. So that brings me to the next question, all right? If it's a banquet, what's on the menu? What's on the menu at this banquet? All the promises of God's word in the Bible. That's what's on the menu. All the promises from God's word in the Bible. 
That's your menu. This book here is your menu called the Bible. God has listed all these promises. In fact, one agency counted them. There are 5,467 promises from God in this book. 5,467. Do you know any of them? Have you memorized any of them? Are you chewing on any of these? Are you digesting any of these? 5,467 of them. The Bible is full of promises that God calls spiritual fruit, spiritual bread, spiritual milk, spiritual meat, spiritual drinks, spiritual sweets, and spiritual a lot of other things. It's food for us. This is why Jesus said in John's gospel, I am the bread of life. He's that bread. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the Bible, God calls this solid food or meat. Look at Hebrews 5, 14. It says this, crave solid food, meaning meat. God's word, which is spiritual meat, so that you can distinguish between good and evil. The Bible, God calls this honey. Look at this verse. Psalm 119, 103. Your promises are so sweet to me, they're like honey to my mouth. How many of you like honey? All right, how many of you call your spouse honey? All right, so you like honey one way or another, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> it's like honey. It, the Bible calls these promises milk. 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So all those banquet terms that is used there throughout Scripture are reminders of these 5,467 promises from God. And when you are in this book, your anger, your anxiety, your anxiousness, your angst, your worry, your fears, if you get in this book and digest the promises, all that's going to go away because that's the jaws of distress that grips you. And when you trust his promises, they release you. Now, God has provided a feast, a banquet in this book. Why would you ever go eat an internet granola bar when there's a feast laid out for you? You're reading the newspaper more than you read this. You're reading magazines more than this. You're reading social media more than this. Why would you do this? Because this is where the promises are. This is what gets you out of the vice grips of distress. Jeremiah writes this in Jeremiah 15. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. Now, you can go to other sources for truth. You can go to other sources to free you from those jaws of distress. And when the people of Israel did this, God inspired the prophet Jeremiah to give a description of what the results were, what was the taste that was in their mouth. Look at Jeremiah 31. The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. All people will die for their own sins. Those who eat the sour grapes will be the ones whose mouths will pucker. You ever eaten something so sour you went, you know what I'm talking about? Like a sweet tart or something like that? That's the effect. So I have a question for you. How much time are you spending in this book compared to the time you spend on the Internet, spending the time on your cell phones, doing social media, spending your time doing all these other things? Those other things, there's not necessarily anything wrong with them, but in comparison to the time, what gets your time what is your resource for truth? Are you feasting or are you fasting on the Word of God? Are you fasting or are you feasting on God's banquet table for you? All the stuff that he's promised to do in your life, you can't do them if you don't know them. God never shuts his blessings until you shut this book. And when you open this book every day, you need to be feeding and eating from it from the banquet that God has prepared for you. So how much are you in this book on a daily basis? We go, well, I... Pastor Kelly, I go to church once a week. That's not enough. Put it this way. Let's say this is the only spiritual food you get right here every Sunday. Now, let's take that to literal food. What if you only ate one meal a week? You'd be anorexic. You'd eventually die. You've got to be in this book every day because it's spiritual food. It's spiritual nourishment. And if you don't know where to start, see me. Get a translation you can read. You don't have to use the King James Version. Use the New Living Translation or the English Standard Version or the Good News Version or the Message, the Living. I don't care. Get a version you can read and understand. 
And if you go, well, I, I really don't know how to read it, I don't know how to study it, well, I teach a class called Class 201. You go, well, I took it, I forgot it. Well, take it again. Swallow your pride. You don't have to stay ignorant of the promises of God. Swallow your pride, take Class 201 again, and learn how to read and study and grow and chew and digest the promises of God. David writes in Psalm 34, 8 this. Learn to savor how good the Lord is. Let me ask you a question. When you read the Bible, do you savor the Word of God? Or do you just read it to be legalistic? You see, when you open this book, it's nourishment, it's food, there are promises, 5,467 of them for you. This is not a book about history. It's not a textbook. It's not a history book. Okay? In fact, it's not even an insurance policy, though it tells us how we can have eternal life. It's not an insurance policy to get you into heaven, though it will help you. It's not an insurance policy to keep you out of hell, though it will do that. I mean, have you ever read an insurance policy? You ever got an insurance policy? How many of you have an insurance policy? All right. You know, it's pages after pages. And they said, now you, uh, now you may want to read all the terms here before you sign your name. What do you do? You sit there and go, give me five hours to read all this. No, you just, where I sign on the dotted line? Because reading insurance policies are boring. You don't do that. So what is this book? This book, the Bible, is God's love letter to you. Because his banner over you is love. When Audrey and I were dating which we hardly really didn't do. She lived here, and I lived in Nashville, Tennessee. And we would call each other. And back then, you didn't have cell phones, so we ran up pretty big, hefty, long-distance bills. But we would write each other. And we'd send little love cards to each other. And every time I would get a little love letter from her or get a little love card from her, I'd immediately open it and read it and just digest it and savor it and go, wow, wow, isn't this awesome? Isn't this awesome that she did this for me? Okay? Like I said, we, we dated in an era where there was no text messaging and no emails and no, none of that stuff, okay? I mean, what if she, she sent me that letter, that card, and I just said, well, you know, I'll read it in a couple of days. And then she calls me that night. Did you read my letter? No, honey, I, you know, I think I'll read it in a couple of days. What do you think she's going to feel? Hey, she ain't going to do that. When she, she, when she wrote me a letter, she sent me a card. I mean, I opened it and I read it immediately. I'd read it over and over and over to almost I had it memorized. Because why? This was a card or a letter, not just from anybody, but this was from a woman who loved me with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength. Listen to me, Southside. This is God's love letter to you. You need to be in it. You need to read it. He's giving you 5,467 promises to chew on, to gnaw on, to get you out of that stress, to get you out of those jaws of distress. David says, you have prepared a banquet for me in the presence of my enemies. In fact, the Bible says there's going to come one day in the future a big banquet, a big feast called the marriage supper of the Lamb of God one day where God wraps up all of history, wraps up everything, and he's going to prepare this big banquet for us, and he's going to honor us for our faithfulness to him, our love for him, and the salvation he's given us. So all of this in his word is about making sure we get there, make sure we are there with him because he loves us, he cares for us. It's his love letter for us. Isaiah says this about that end of time. The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of the finest food for all peoples, meaning it doesn't matter if you're red or yellow, black and white, doesn't matter what your nationality is, doesn't matter what your denomination is, doesn't matter your gender. He's going to prepare a feast for, of food for all peoples, a banquet of the best meats and finest wines. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people and the sheet that covers all nations. So what is that shroud? that he's going to destroy. What is that? What's that sheet? The Hebrew word for shroud is halat. And it refers to the cloth they used to wrap a dead body in. If you've ever seen how they wrap a mummy, it's the same type of thing. And so this shroud would be symbolic of what it wraps around us. It reminds us of the gloom of death because all of us know one day we're going to die. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. 
unless Jesus returns in our lifetime, all of us are going to have a grave marker. So all of us live under this gloom of death. When is it coming? How can I keep it off? How can I postpone it? And everybody knows they're going to die. They just don't like to think about it. Bill Bryson, in his book, A Body, A Guide for Occupants, talks about the marvels of the human body, how God created it. And he goes into great detail of every aspect of the body. Okay? But the part of the book I found most interesting is where he talks about the largest organ in the body. Do you know what the largest organ is in your body? Your skin. It's the largest organ. He says this, the skin consists of an inner layer called dermis and an outer layer called epidermis. The outermost surface of the epidermis is made up of entirely dead skin cells. It is an arresting thought that what makes you lovely in appearance to everyone is what is dead. He says, where the body meets air, we're all cadavers. He says, these outer skin cells are replaced every month. We shed skin copiously, almost carelessly, some 25,000 flakes a minute, over a million pieces every hour. He says, so if you go into your house and you run your finger across any tabletop, across any mantle, that dust is your dead skin. It's a reminder I'm going to die one day. He says, isn't it interesting how God almost humorously reminds us of this? And what he is saying is that dust that's there in your house is primarily all the dead skin cells from everyone who lives there. It's a visible reminder that one day we are all going to die. So what are the sheets that Isaiah talks about? This is the Hebrew word mesakah. And what is that? That's the cloud of grief that we all experience when we lose someone that dies. And God is saying, one day I'm going to get rid of death itself, and I'm going to get rid of all grieving itself. There's coming a day there's going to be this banquet, and I'm going to wipe away all tears. There's, there's not going to be any more crying anymore because death is gone. Death is defeated. It's no there. And that reminds me, you have a fourth enemy, and that enemy is the devil. It's not just the devil. It's death. That's the last enemy that God's going to defeat. He says he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. I'm waiting for the day. I'm not anxious to jump into it yet, but... Won't you be glad when God one day says, death is gone? There's no more grieving. There's no more sadness. There's no more sorrow. There's none of that stuff. There's just one big banquet table for us to sit down and dine with a God who loves us. And all that disgrace and all those put-downs we've endured through the years will be replaced by God's wonderful grace. He says he will wipe away their tears. He will remove the disgrace of the people from all the earth. And in that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him. He saved us. Yes, this is the Lord. We trusted in him. So let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And I thought, well, how do I wrap this up? I read a, a book called A Grace Revealed, written by a man named Jerry Setzer. He says in the fall of 1991, he was driving the family minivan with his wife, his mother, and their four children. Out of nowhere, this car driven by a drunk driver crossed the lane and hit them head on. Jerry's wife was killed, his mother was killed, and some of their children were killed. He said it was a tragedy just to be left alone of four kids, one child, everyone else was killed. So we had this big, massive funeral to say goodbye to the people we loved. And he said, I, I spent every time I could with my son, who was eight years old at the time, trying to make sure he got through this tragedy. He said, one day we were riding in the car. I was taking him to a soccer match. And he said, Dad, do you think Mom and Grandmom and my sisters can see us right now? That's a pretty good question for an eight-year-old. And Jerry Setzer said, I struggled as, how do I answer this question? Because I could tell the grief was still plaguing him. 
he was still caught in the jaws of that distress as he was. He said, I, I paused to put my words together and I said, well, I don't know, David. I think maybe sh they do see us. Why do you ask? His son said, I, I don't see how mom and grandmom and sisters could see us. I thought heaven was full of happiness. How could they bear to see us grieving the loss of them here on this earth? Jerry said he kept driving. He began trying to put words together. He said, son, that's a, I understand where you're coming from. He says, the reason I think they all can see us is because they can see the whole story, including how it all turns out, which is beautiful to them. It's going to be a good story, David. Why, son? Because in spite of the loss of your mom, your grandmom, and your two sisters, our God is a good God who helps us when we're in that valley. And as we're going through it, he prepares a banquet for us in the presence of our enemies to free us from the jaws of distress and grief. Southside. Our God is a good God all the time. Let's pray.